sure that you guys were all clear on what I uh, what I wanted with the uh, the assignment for the XOR project. Okay, so let's take a look at this schematic. Let me zoom in a little bit. Okay, so this collectively is an XOR gate. Okay, and um, and I just realized I've got a mistake on it, which I'll fix. Um, okay, so XOR you can think of as being, well, so what's one way of saying, explaining what the idea of exclusive OR is? It's one or the other, but not both. Okay, so A or B needs to be true, but what also needs to be true is that not and, okay? And both of those things have to be true, okay? So let me actually just draw the schematic, uh, a, a, sorry, a slightly more high-level schematic, um, and maybe this will be a little bit more clear. Um, okay, so let's go to the iPad, I'll switch. Oops. Okay, so one view of XOR would be to say um, in English A or B, but not both. Okay, and that uh, way of saying it in English, first off, is it clear what we mean, right? So what was our example that that demonstrated? Desserts. Yeah, desserts, right? So do you want chocolate or vanilla ice cream? what's the implication? You probably can't have both chocolate and vanilla, okay? Um, all right, and so uh, circuit-wise, the way that we can think of this Well, it would help if I could draw this morning. Okay, is this. So these symbols, right, what is the top left one? This is a what kind of gate? That's an OR gate. This is a NAND gate, and this is an AND gate. Okay, so <clears throat> the, the, um, the scheme here is if it has a rounded back, it's uh, an OR gate. If it has a square back, it's an AND gate. And then that you see the little loop here on that makes it a NAND gate. So it's a, a the loop is a negation. Okay. Okay. So that collectively, this entire thing is equivalent to an XOR gate. Okay, so an XOR gate is an OR gate, but it has an extra sort of thing at the back. Um, and that's just, that's the symbol that we use for it. Okay, so the idea of XOR, you can have chocolate or vanilla, but not both, right, is you can have, <clears throat> that would be a true statement that you're having chocolate or vanilla, or sorry, chocolate XOR vanilla, if you are in fact having some ice cream, right, so... A or B needs to be true, and it also is the case that you're not having both of them. So that's why we have the NAND gate. And then both of those con ideas need to be true, which is why their outputs go into this AND gate. Okay, so you see how we're using the output from one gate as the input for another? Yes. Uh, no, precise, so NAND is true if one or the other is true, but not both being true, right? Okay, so what is AND true? AND is true only when both are true. So NAND is the opposite of that, okay? 
Um, and so, yeah, let's just write the truth table to remind ourselves. What's the and truth table? They both have to be on for the output to be on, okay? And so if that's the AND gate uh, truth table, then the NAND gate truth table would be the opposite of it. <clears throat> so the zeros turn into ones and the ones turn into zeros because it's a logical negation. So what's the difference between AND and ones? Ah, okay. So NAND, um, so XOR's truth table would be this. Right, so the difference is that one entry, okay? So um, XOR, if, if I ask you, are you eating vanilla XOR chocolate and you're not eating any ice cream at all, then you would answer no, right? But if I ask you, are you eating vanilla NAND chocolate, you would, and you're not eating any ice cream, you would answer yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So the the one the two, the entry I circled in blue is different between uh, NAND versus XOR. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. Okay. So does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so let's go back over to the schematic. All right, so what do we need to construct then according to the diagram that I just drew? We need an AND gate, we need an OR gate, and we need an AND gate. Well, fortunately, you guys have three breadboards, so why don't you put one of them on each breadboard and make sure that each one works individually, okay? And then we'll put them together. Okay, so the good news is the NAND gate, you've already built it, right? That should be one of your breadboards, okay? Then for the AND and the OR gate, we have to do something a little funky. So let me look at the, uh, the uh, AND, or, yeah, the AND gate. Okay, so this part of it right here, okay, do you guys agree that that's an AND gate? Or NAND gate, excuse me. Okay, that's one we've already wired. Okay, so how do I wire an AND gate if I've already got a NAND gate? And if the NAND gate is the easier thing to do. Well, what's the other kind of gate that we made with these things before we did the NAND gate at all? The very first one was an inverter, right? The NOT gate, okay, so how did the NOT gate look? It was just two transistors. So this little segment over here is a NOT gate. Yeah? Okay, so how do I get AND? I do NOT AND and then negate the answer. Okay, so I do an a a NAND gate followed by an inverter. Okay, so how many t total transistors does that take? Well, we can count six, right? And how many of each kind? Three of each, right? It always comes, they always come in pairs like that. Uh, that's the whole point of CMOS, okay? So, what are all these other symbols then? Well, um, what are these two things over here? What do those signify? Those are the LEDs, okay? So, uh, so let's let's actually just concentrate on the NAND gate, the first one here, okay? Because that's this is what you guys have already wired up, okay? The only thing that I've left off of this one is the output LED that you guys put on there just to make sure it works correctly, okay? But otherwise, this is the NAND gate that you've already done. And what did we do with the two inputs? We put LEDs for both inputs so that we could see, so there were three total LEDs, right? The two inputs and the one output, and then you could watch the blinking lights and make sure that the truth table worked. Yeah. Uh, do you need uh, a little more output power? 
Ah, good question. Same pro, same code works. Okay. Yes. So you can go from one, you can daisy chain them, right? So if you plug, uh, so like on the pin two or pin four or whatever on the Arduino, right? You can only fit one wire in there. Well, so you go take that wire and go to a breadboard and then take another wire and go from the breadboard to the next breadboard, right? So, so yeah, you can. Now, we wouldn't want to do this with like 500 breadboards, okay? But for just three of them, that's that's fine, right? Um, okay, so this does John's question make sense? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what you'll do is just daisy chain them. Um, now that said, my suggestion here is get each one to work individually before you start trying to put them together. Because if you try and put them all together and it doesn't work right, then figuring out where the problem is is going to be much harder. Okay, so build each one individually, and of course one of them you've already done, right, the NAND gate. Um, so then, yeah, okay. Uh, so here I've got my input LEDs to see whether or not, you know, the inputs are on or off. We built this, right, this is our NAND gate. Okay, so if I want an AND gate, what do I need to tack on to the end of it? an inverter. Okay, so that's what we've got here. This section over there is a NAND gate, and then I've tacked on an inverter. Okay, and then finally I have an output LED just to, so that's sort of the ultimate output LED. Okay, uh, and then down at the bottom, this is where I just noticed that I have a typo, um, is <clears throat> the OR gate followed by an inverter. Uh, these two inputs on the lights should be A and B, not uh, the NAND output or the OR output. Uh, so I'll fix that and re-upload it. Um, okay, but the other thing is, so how do I know that this is an OR gate? Well, how did we build, how did we build an AND gate? We first built a NAND gate and then we inverted it, yes? So how should I build an OR gate? I'll first build a NOR gate, and then invert it. Okay, so what's different about the NOR gate versus the NAND gate, structurally? Well, okay, the PMOS transistors, how are they arranged in this circuit, right? Where are PMOSs as these two? Those are in series, and the NMOSs are in parallel, whereas with the NAND gate, how are they arranged? The PMOSs were in parallel, and the NMOSs are in series, okay? So they're complementary arrangements. Um, so, yeah, that's how you know, okay? Um, okay, so when all said and done, the output LED, which is way the heck over here, Okay, when will it be on? When one or the other, but not both, is on. So when precisely one of the input lights is on, or the other, but never when both, and not when neither, okay? Now, this is not the only way to build an XOR gate with these transistors, okay? Um, now, how do I know that? Well, you guys remember, this is what, I guess about a week ago, and we were doing all the Boolean algebra stuff, and we had like De Morgan's laws, and I was doing all this crazy logic stuff. Well, I could take the expression that I just wrote down, A or B, and not A and not B, right? And if I start applying these De uh, Boolean uh, rules to that, I can produce an equivalent expression to it, that maybe involves fewer terms, but still equivalent, and then I could build a circuit that does that. Okay, um, yeah, so there is more than one way to do that, or to, to build an XOR circuit. This is maybe the conceptually the simplest one, okay, because it just means building three individual pieces and then putting them together, okay? Um, yeah.
So, um, yeah, okay, so I just want to make sure that we're all cool on this. So, uh, what are we going to do on Friday? Build it? No, you're going to pull it out of the box, and I'm going to be like, looks good, or F, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing we're going to do on Friday is do a uh, discussion over some reading, which I'll post as the canvas uh, here briefly. Okay. So uh, about basically when overflow and n when numerical errors on a computer have caused death and or destruction. And yeah, basically to impress upon you why you really need to care about not screwing up uh, numerical data with a computer so you don't kill people okay um okay so gucci yeah okay all right so let's actually go over to my raspberry pi and wake it up Okay, and so what I want to talk about today is we've spent a considerable amount of time talking about how numbers are stored on a computer, okay, either as integers or as floating point, okay, and we looked at, you know, how do you do arithmetic with these things, et cetera, okay, um, but certainly numbers are not the only thing that we might want to store on a computer, Yeah. So how is text stored on a computer? Right, so for example, let me just, Okay, so I just made a nice file. Um, and I want to do slash, is it, hang on one second, I'm, I'm blanking on the, oops. I want to see, okay. Okay, so if I look at what this thing has output, I just created a file that says Wabash always fights in it. It's got text, yay. And then what I've had this little program called hex dump to is basically show me how that file, what the actual data is in terms of its, it's, it's just a bunch of binary numbers, right? But uh, the reason I wanna do that is to look at how this is encoded and how do I, how do I, how can I like just look at this and know that without seeing this stuff over here, how can I look at that and know that I am actually seeing Wabash always fights, okay? so. Uh, the encoding scheme that's used here is called ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, -I, and it stands for something, and I don't remember, it's American Standard something, something dark side. Um, no, I don't get any laughter for the dark side reference. You know, the, uh, the family guy, one of the, their Star Wars Lampoon movies, so it's like something, something, something dark side. No, it's pathetic. Okay, so it's it's called ASCII. Okay, and ASCII originally was a seven-bit scheme. Uh, later extended to what's called extended ASCII to be an eight-bit scheme, and it is how we encode text, numbers, like as in the symbols for the numbers, not the numerical values. Um and a few other things, and we'll look at a table that shows us all of the, the ASCII values, okay? But looking at this, uh, what do you notice 
looking at that sequence of numbers. Well, each character is how many, how much data does it take to represent each character, each letter? It's exactly one byte, okay? So each one of those pairs of numbers, like five, seven, uh, that's one byte, okay? It's in hexadecimal, so I say five, seven and not 57 because it's not 57. Each hexadecimal symbol stands for four bits, right? So two hexadecimal symbols stand for eight bits, which is one byte, okay? How many letters do I have here? Well, I got six, six and six, that makes 18, okay? I've also got the exclamation mark and 19 and two spaces, so that's 20 and 21, yes? Okay, so this file has how many bytes in it? Oops, would help if I used the correct keyboard. It has how many bytes? That's 22 bytes. So there's only 21 symbols, including the spaces and stuff. So why does it take 22 bytes? Yeah, in this case, it's the zero A that's at the back that tells me that I've hit the end of the line, okay? Um, and that needs to get encoded, basically. Um, okay, so the scheme here, like you look at this and, and yeah, you can see that there's maybe a pattern to it. So like, look at the lowercase a's, what are they? Six one, right? There is a, a logical pattern to this. Okay, but you wouldn't be able to necessarily easily reverse engineer it if I just handed you a bunch of stuff. Okay, so let's look at a table of all of the ASCII values. Uh, how many of you guys, by the way, have seen The Martian? Yeah, uh, so the, an ASCII table is a key plot device in that movie, right? Because when he gets the space, uh, the like rover that has the rotating camera on it and he sets up the stakes around, he realizes that he can't do 36 sta or, uh, stakes because he would need the letters A through Z plus the numbers, and that would just be too many things, and the angles wouldn't be very good. So what does he do? He realizes he only needs 16 stakes, uh, 0 through F, and then they'll know, oh, send it in ASCII. Yeah? You remember that part of the movie? Yeah? All right, well... Okay, so the first 32 of these uh, things that are encoded in ASCII may seem a little bit, um, a little bit uh, weird to us nowadays, particularly say number seven or number 13, which is D or A, okay. So LF actually stands for line feed. 13, or the D, this stands for carriage return, okay? And number seven, BEL, stands for bell. Line feed, carriage return, bell. Is that ringing any bells? Pardon the terrible pun. Yeah. Has anybody ever used a typewriter? No? John, you, you're nodding your head. Have you used a typewriter? Okay, so you're using your typewriter. How do you use a typewriter? Okay. Right, so how do you know you hit the end of the line? You hit the edge, but the, the typewriter makes a ding. Guess what bell means? Make a ding. Okay, and line feed means to crank the paper uh, reel by one click, which is one line worth, so that you can carriage return, right? That means to take the 
you know, when you're typing, the little thing moves to the right, and then you have to shut the, the bell rings, and you shove it to the left and advance the line, and then do the next line, right? So this is all stuff from old like typewriter days, okay? And in particular, how did printers work way back in the day? They were what we call teletype machines. They were essentially electrically controlled typewriters, but it was like a literal typewriter go, 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 down the line. And then bing, and it would write. So this is how you told the typewriter module, hey, make a ding or uh, go to the end of the line or, you know, advance to the next line or whatever. Okay. So, yeah, so there's a lot of old typewriter lingo in here that may seem kind of crazy nowadays. But for that matter, why are the keys laid out the order that they are in? Why, who thought to put Q in the top left of the, the letters? Right? Why why are the keys laid out that way? Yeah? They keep them on because you can make up the way that on the average you will take one key with your left hand and one one with your right. Okay. Uh that would be the Dvorak layout, which is not QWERTY. Okay. So QWERTY, the layout that we have, when typewriters were first invented, they just put the letters in alphabetical order. What other order would you do? Okay. Well, what happens if you use a typewriter? So when you hit a key on a typewriter, what happens? Huh? What hits the paper? There's a little arm corresponding to that key that goes smash, right? And there's a little ink ribbon, and it smashes that against the paper and makes the indentation of whatever letter, okay? And then it retracts. They're spring-loaded. And you hit the next key and another arm comes up, okay? Well, so what happened was when uh, typists were, you know, they got pretty fast at this and the keys started jamming, right? If you type too fast and you get two keys, they'll run into each other, okay? So the QWERTY layout was actually designed to minimize the jams from uh, the, the little arms, okay? Do we have to worry about keys jamming anymore? So then why the hell do we still use QWERTY? Actually, yes, it is tradition in this case, but do you want to relearn a keyboard layout? Hell no, okay? So you already know how to type with the QWERTY layout, and we're stuck with it, even though nobody uses freaking typewriters anymore, okay? Now, there is one other layout that I mentioned called Dvorak, which does what Thomas says, and it seeks to optimize not for minimizing jams, but to maximize the number of times that you're alternating left hand, right hand, okay? Because if you're currently pressing something with your left hand, your right hand can be moving its, the, the appropriate finger in position, and then you can tie it faster that way, okay? Uh, I tried learning Dvorak at one point in high school, and I nearly threw myself out an airlock. I was just like, "Nope, forget this. I'm, I'm nope. Cordy is fast enough. I'm not. I'm not messing with it." Okay. That said, um, how many of you guys have studied either French or German, or are studying French or German? Have you ever? T which one? French or German? Have you ever tried to type in German? Uh, okay. Well, why are you just in the 101 or something? Okay, well, the German keyboard layout is not QWERTY, it's QWERTS. And the French keyboard layout is not QWERTY, it's AZERTY, right? So the, the letters are in different positions, some of them, not all of them, in different languages. And so if you were to go to Germany and go to like a public library or something and try and use a computer, the keys are slightly laid out different, and you just have to get used to that. Um, it's not as bad as relearning an entire layout, but it's still a little annoying, okay? And eventually it's just muscle memory. I mean, when I'm typing, I have two keystrokes that'll switch the keyboard from, you know, advance the key layout to its next thing, and I've got four keyboard layouts, so English, French, Unicode, and Ancient Greek, um, you know, as one does. Um, yeah, Socrates using his Commodore, you know, back in the day. All right, so let's look at the actual letters for all of this stuff, okay? So they start, they're symbols, so we've got spaces, we've got various punctuation marks, parentheses, plus minus, the period, 
Okay, the digits zero through nine, some more symbols. Okay, then we've got the uppercase characters, A through Z, some more symbols. Then we've got the lowercase characters, A through Z. Then we've got a few more symbols, the tilde, and so on. Okay, so there are the original 128 ASCII symbols. And it's 128 because originally, like I said, ASCII was a seven-bit scheme. Okay, and two to the seventh is 128. Anybody notice anything missing? I mean, we got a whole pile of symbols here. This is great. So what's sort of the issue with this? There it is. I just blew past it, but it's there. There it is. Okay. Yeah, new line was back in the first 32, which are non-printing. So that's the line feed uh, or carriage return. Yeah. Huh? Bing, 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 bing. This is very American-centric, American-English-centric, right? Merca. Okay, but I mean this... To be fair, this is the American standard, right? So, uh, right. So the problem here, or a problem, is that it doesn't have the ability to do non-English characters, okay? Um, including um, Latin characters that are, okay, so here's the extended ASCII. Let me blow this up so it's a little easier to see. Um, the ex extended ASCII, added in another 128 characters, so making it a full 8-bit scheme. And in particular, what's missing? Well, what about if you wanted to be able to type in Spanish or French, right? Spanish and French both use the same alphabet as English, but there's a couple of characters that have extra decorations on them, right? So in Spanish, you've got the N with the tilde above it, right? In French, you have the A, or sorry, the C with the little dangly bit, right, and some other things, okay, um, and uh, right, so all of those characters got added in the extension of Unicode, basically all of these sort of uh, English or Roman letters with extra little uh, decorations on them, accents, basically, okay. Then you've also got the upside down question mark. You've got some currency symbols. So we've got the pound, the yen. I'm not sure what that one is. Um, we've got the quotation marks that they use in French because they have to do them differently, of course. Um, we've got the, the degree symbol uh, for like temperature or something. Uh, then we also have not all of the Greek letters, but a, a handful of them. Uh, the ones that are most commonly used in mathematics, right? So alpha, beta, capital gamma, lowercase pi, sigma, um, lowercase sigma, right? We've got an infinity symbol. We've got symbols for different inequalities, uh, symbols to make an integral sign, a radical sign, exponents, right? Like, so all of this stuff is great for mathematics. And then all these weird looking symbols in the middle there, are for making like menus and boxes and stuff, okay? Because there was no graphical interface back in the day. It was all text, yeah. So is that why, like, if you're going to do ASCII, what does ASCII part? Like, all that stuff just these? They're just using all of these symbols, and it's kind of like if they use a lot of them and make them really small and you sort of zoom out, then it looks like something. Right. So the you know, if you see your Rafflecopter or whatever, right, that's just a bunch of letters and stuff, but it kind of looks like it's a helicopter. Yeah, that's ASCII art. Right. OK. Um, but this is still pretty Western centric. Right. We can't type Cyrillic. Right. So the Russians are SOL. We can't fully type Greek. Right. So how do we get all the other letters? Not to mention, what about the various Asian, East Asian languages? 
Like how many symbols are there in Chinese? A lot. It's thousands, right? I only can encode 256 things. Well, that's annoying. Okay, so what's the other way of doing this? Unicode. Yes, okay, so Unicode. All right, so let's go to the Unicode website is another encoding scheme that goes way beyond eight bits, okay? In fact, it defines for, you can use up to 32 bits, which gets you billions of symbols, okay? Now, you might say, I don't really need billions of symbols, but then emoji happened, okay? And so now there's a Unicode symbol for the freaking poop emoji, okay? But there's not Klingon. The poop emoji, sure. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's the code charts for, um, for all of Unicode and they update this as they add things. Right. Um, and Unicode, one, one of the things that's nice about it is that all of the Latin letters are actually still in ASCII, so it's backwards compatible. So anything that's written in ASCII is valid Unicode, but not vice versa, okay? So ASCII, for example, if we look at that part of the code table, right, here they are. So the exclamation point is 2, 1, and so on. Well, everything looks perfectly logical the way that we had it before, okay? Um, so they, they preserved ASCII inside of Unicode, but then added a whole bunch of extra stuff to it. So for example, I don't know, when's the last time anybody needed to type in linear B syllabary? Yeah. So there's symbols from linear B. You know, just for, for the times you need to type that. Um, or, uh, you know, I actually had this, this, uh, this problem of needing to be able to type cuneiform, right? Now, specifically, I was going after cuneiform numerals, which are, you know, in the pile here someplace. But, um, you know, as one does, you might need to type cuneiform. If you're a scholar who studies this stuff, it would be kind of nice to be able to typeset it. Yeah? Uh, okay, what about the East Asian languages? So let's take, for example, uh, Chinese. Okay, so let's look at, and this is a pretty big file, because as we've said, there's thousands of characters in Chinese. Okay, so it'll take a minute to load. Okay, and they're all sorted in some sort of scheme. Uh, is anybody studying Chinese? Or has anybody studied it? So things are organized by radicals and the stroke patterns and stuff are really important. And so that's why it, it, it's organized in this way. And you'll notice that there's some blanks in there that aren't actually used. Um, and that's basically to kind of keep things as sorted as possible. Um, and, you know, presumably somebody who, um, you know, not just knows Chinese, but is sort of like a Chinese linguist, it's really an expert in it, uh, was involved in deciding what layout to put these things in, how to organize them uh, in a way that's sort of logical for speakers of that language. Okay. Um, and, you know, the list goes on and on because there are lots and lots of these symbols. I don't know any Chinese yet, so, um, yeah, yet, but, um, okay. So ASCII basically uh, extends, or sorry, is extended by um, this, and then uh, we've got all of the, the stupid, um, um, the stupid emoji that are all in here somewhere, okay? Uh, like, you know, and how many of you guys have texted an emoji 
within the last 24 hours. Like it was probably like the crying, laughing emoji or something like that. But I don't know. I mean, there were probably some eggplants getting typed too. Yeah. Followed, of course, by an eggplant or a peach, depending on your proclivities, right? Uh, no. And okay. So anyway, but point being, right? Uh, Unicode has now uh, extended with all of the the silly emoji characters. And they're all separate emoji or separate characters. Now, just because it's encoded that way, doesn't that's different from how it actually looks on your screen. Okay, so for example, this is maybe five or six years ago, but uh, if you typed the the cheeseburger emoji on an Apple device versus the cheeseburger emoji on an Android, okay, so everybody do that right now. Get your phone out and type uh, in a text message uh, the cheeseburger emoji. Yeah, yeah, there, that's, that'd be even better. Just crap tons of cheeseburger emojis on Yik Yak, okay. Um, okay, so when you do that, I want you to describe to me, and I'm popping open Yik Yak right now so we can see a flood of cheeseburger emojis. Okay, there's one. All right, so the first one here, let's describe how the cheeseburger looks to me. So I see a, a bottom bun, followed by lettuce, followed by the patty, followed by the slice of cheese, followed by the tomato, followed by the top bun. Okay, what monster puts the lettuce on the bottom? Hmm? Yeah, Apple. Okay, but on an Android device, the order of the toppings may look different. Okay, and in fact, at one point, not only did they have, uh, I forget if it was Android or, or Apple, they had the cheese underneath the patty. And this just will not do. Okay, so the way that it's actually displayed is not the same as the way the character is encoded, right? So the Unicode encoding for the cheeseburger is not a picture of a cheeseburger. It's just a number, and that number is the number assigned to the cheeseburger emoji. The actual image for how it looks is a completely separate matter, okay? And this is why your emojis can look different on different systems, even though they're the same number, uh, essentially, in Unicode, okay? Uh, and there's other examples of this. So like the, um, uh, many years ago, Apple changed the gun emoji to a squirt gun instead of a actual, like, Real gun, okay. Um, they didn't change anything in Unicode. They just changed how it got displayed on the screen. So now it's a little water pistol rather than a, a real pistol, okay. And yeah, you can debate the merits of of that change later. You want to threaten people with a real one and not a squirt gun? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Uh, just so we're all clear, you guys are going to, uh, on Friday morning, what am I going to do? When I get my coffee, I'm also going to wheel over the cart full of uh, things. And you'll all get your buckets, and you'll all plug them in. And I'll walk around with my little clipboard and be like, hey, look, it works. Great. Or you all fail. Okay. Uh, now, one point, I I'm going to be a jerk about this. One point on the grade on that project is you'll actually have to do that one point next week because what's that point going to be, do you think? No. Cleaning up, right? So when it's all done and, and we verified it works and it's time to tear it apart, you guys are going to put everything back in their appropriate baggies. And I'm going to hold a point over your head to make you do it. Yeah? Okay. All right. Have a great rest of your week. I'll see you on Friday.